Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. We are very pleased to have you all today for the first Agora talk that we have organized during the week of Le Bourget. This Agora uh, initiative is going to be a um, series of events that you will have during the whole week. And each time we have a different uh, interlocutor. This interactivity will start today with the media. So welcome to the representative of the media and all the media who wish to come over, you're more than welcome to come along. This new setup here is made for questions and answers, but also for interaction with you. So we have for you and for about 90 minutes, Director General Jan Werner and his team of directors, who you will get to know very soon, since they will all have a chance to talk. So without waiting, Jan, it's on you. Thank you very much, uh, Philippe, and ladies and gentlemen, it's uh, really a special pleasure for me because we are doing something disruptive, we are trying something, a new format, and I always like to try new formats. Uh, again, uh, as Philip was saying, you will have the chance to also to ask, I mean the media, you have to ask uh, each and every one of uh, them here, these are all the directors of ESA. One is missing, but we have a good substitute today, and you will see that um, Philip Goudy will substitute Josef Aschbacher, who is responsible for Earth observation, but he will be with us uh, using satellites, of course, uh, by Skype from, uh, from uh, California. So I will go through some pictures, and then uh, each of the uh, different uh, directors will present something, and then we have a chance to have a chat about different things. So space 4.0, as you know, this is something I'm always saying all the time. Today we read it a little bit different, so meaning space for, and then you can read, you can go on, uh, meaning for our future. Um, it does, it, you see, for our future, space for our future. So this is the idea, and we, uh, we will go, and uh, it is ESA in motion, it is the wind of change, and I will try to give you just a few hints about what is really changing right now and uh, how can all of you and all of us participate in that uh, way. There are global challenges, we all know that we know these global challenges. Uh, some of them are uh, also on a personal level, some of them are really just something we have to tackle on a global scale. You might have your own priority list. And so I um, don't say number one, two, three, four, five, six, seven or so, Climate change is something which is really something which uh, is uh, of very high priority. But you see the, the last one in this list is mentioning curiosity. Curiosity is a very special challenge. It's more a driver, a driver for humankind, because through um, curiosity we are doing things who never, which never were done before. And uh, all of this comes then to space 4.0, meaning inform, innovate, interact, and inspire. These are the four, four key words which we would like really to work on. So now if you look into this and you see on the right hand side again, information, innovation, interaction, inspiration, but on the left hand side you see also what is changing right now. Uh, we have a total change of the situation. We are not any longer in the Cold War. We are now in the motivation of different member states of ESA, but also of different spacefaring nations worldwide, to use space for quite different purposes, for applications, for very practical things, but also to inspire, inspire the society. We have different actors, not only the superpowers. We have today more than 70 spacefaring nations worldwide, Plus, industry is now providing also their special own space missions. So we have a different type of actors. We have different contents. We have also different roles. The space agencies of the past were just funding agencies doing all the control, the procurement, all the different steps um, finally to uh, succeed with the mission. This one will sustain, we will have this role also in the future, but we will have additional roles. For instance, when uh, industry would like to provide some or realize some space mission, then we are in the role of enablers. Maybe also in relation with other countries outside Europe, we are the facilitators or the brokers. So it's, it's a new world which is coming up um, and this means also new technologies. It's not only about 3D printing, 
um, and uh, additive manufacturing. But if you look, for instance, also to quantum entanglement, a new basic technology which is uh, now more or less understood, we can use it also for, um, for instance, cyber security, for secured quantum cryptography. So there is a lot of changes, and on the right-hand side, you see what we are doing out of this. It's not only new space that we have new actors also from industry, but it's more the commercialization as such. We are giving more rights and more responsibility also to industry. We are doing spin-off all the time already. I mean, in the past, coming technologies from space to earthly um, applications. Now we are doing also the other way, using technologies from different areas on Earth and use them in space. Participation. Uh, when uh, uh, the people decided, or not, uh, when the politicians decided at the, in the middle of the last century to have this race in space, they did not ask the people. They did it from a political point of view. Now it's time also to consider the information and the uh, opinions of the broad public. And it's about global cooperation, jobs and growth, and of course also digitalization. So all of this comes together and this is then forming space 4.0. So this is the main message uh, I would like to give to you, convey to you in this moment. Space 4.0, as I said, has a spin-in and the spin-off effect. And Space 4.0 is really also looking for a borderless Europe. If you look from space, there is no border of Europe. The only thing which you can see in this picture, if you have, a very good, if you have very good glasses, there are some clouds over UK. So, uh, uh, so this is something, but uh, only some clouds, nothing more than that. And uh, we are trying to really work for United Space in Europe. This is the other keyword, Space 4.0, and the other one, United Space in Europe. And space can bridge all these earthly crises and conflicts we have. So therefore, this is another point we would like to do. And we are trying also to bring together, in this sense, the actors in Europe. So ESA has a convention since 1975, so we are on stable ground, so to say. Now, since uh, 2009, we have also the Lisbon Treaty. The Lisbon Treaty gives some clear task also to the European Union and the European Commission. And in order not to have a parallel world, but to have a joint work, we had discussed and uh, signed last year a joint uh, understanding, a joint document, which has three main objectives. The first one is full integration of space into a European economy and society, for instance, through Earth observation, climate change, weather forecast, etc. A globally competitive European space sector, industry and academia by sharing risks, for instance, in public-private partnership projects, sharing risk and sharing investments to make really the European space sector competitive in the world. Not to fight against the world, but only if you are competitive, you can also cooperate. You will never be accepted to be a cooperative partner if you are weak. And the third one is European autonomy in accessing and using space. And this means, for instance, launchers or a navigation system. Again, it's not to be against the others, but to be strong and to be also independent of uh, any political movements. So again, all these three, plus the overarching uh, goal, European identity, spirit and cohesion, and the underpinning excellence in space science and technology was signed on the 26th of October last year in Brussels between the European Union and the European Space Agency. And therefore, it's important that we understand these global challenges need global cooperation, and ESA is ready to do so. ESA is part of this uh, overarching uh, work. So if you look to this, we, ESA, we would like to provide to Europe a lot of things. You can see we are providing new technologies. We are providing the access to space, inspiration, the visibility of Europe worldwide, and also the um, European identity, spirit, and cohesion, which is especially in times when we are facing some European, I should say, heavy discussions, uh, it's important that we have also these positive things in mind. And ESA is trying with all its work to do so. And therefore, you will uh, now hear in a minute from the different directors about their 
special work which is supporting these different areas. ESA is, and I have to mention that, um, according to its convention from 1975, um, still the single European space organization which provides end-to-end -end management and implementation, Earth observation, um, navigation, telecommunication, uh, science and exploration with humans and robotics. We are developing new launcher systems, IANA 64, 62 and Vega C. Also spacecrafts for the re-entry possibility to stay in low Earth orbit for a period and then come back. We are doing uh, technology development, integrated applications, but also satellite uh, operations. And of course, we are also looking to what happens around us if uh, meteorites, asteroids are coming closer to the Earth. And the very right hand side of this picture should show we are doing industrial policy with our uh, different methods, geo return and others, our procurement rules. We are supporting the European industry to be competitive. Now, we will start with the different directors. You will see them in this uh, order. So first will be Magali Vezier. Um, the second one will then be Paul Verhoef. Third one, by, hopefully by Skype, Josef Aschbacher. Otherwise, Philip, you have to do it if there is a problem with our satellites. Uh, and then we have uh, for the launchers, uh, Daniel Neunschwander sitting next to me. Uh, then uh, Franco Ongaro about technologies, exploration by uh, David Parker. Uh, for science, Alvaro Jimenez uh, will talk. For operations, Rolf Densing. For industry and procurement, finally, Eric Morel. We have also Jean-Marc Spirsch here. He is responsible for all the human resources and the internal uh, financial management. And he is also ready to answer any type of questions. With that, I hand over to you, Magali. Wait a moment. So, good afternoon, everyone. I don't know if you will be able to listen to me, but nevertheless, I've decided to illustrate uh, the Space for Zero, Space for the Future in Telecom, with the illustration of what we are going to do to uh, participate into the 5G. 5G, which is... Okay, so what is 5G? As a matter of fact, I think that in the SATCOM world, we can say that it will be probably drive most of the innovations that we will uh, introduce in the next two to three years in the SATCOM domain. In fact, 5G is not just the new generation of mobile networks. It's more than just 4G plus 1G, because in fact, it will allow to provide services to everyone and to everything. It will allow the convergence of mobile and fixed networks. And on top, it will, have, uh, it will put a specific emphasis on the business-to-business -business markets, on the so-called vertical markets. It will imply a set of technologies, not just a, a single technology that would be terrestrial, but a mix of technology. It will imply networks of networks and not using a single set of standards, but more, more standards than just one single one. And we cannot deny that it will probably put some more pressure on the access to spectrum. In fact, satellite has really the right and sp uh, attribute of specificity to address the 5G and 5G services. It will allow to address some security-related applications like disaster relief, like emergency and safety. It will enable to provide more resilience to terrestrial networks. It will allow to enlarge the coverage to address isolated regions. And of course, it will allow mobile and broadband communications. So satellite, we are convinced, now must be getting ready for the 5G generation. And in fact, there is a window of opportunity for satellite because at the same time, the, the, at the European level, uh, there is a trial roadmap which is under preparation. And we are sure that uh, the existing satellites or even the satellites under development will offer new means that could be very useful even for this first set of trials. 
So we have in front of us a unique opportunity for the SATCOM world to seize and make sure that satellite can play a big role. In fact, 5G, in summary, is an opportunity of paradigm change, where for once, satellite would not be relegated in niche markets, but could become an enabler of the main user experience. So satellite could even have a transformative effect in the sense that it could open new markets for 5G services and extend existing ones. So satellite, again, will be part of the mixture of technology together with, uh, uh, of course, uh, cellular uh, Wi-Fi solutions, terrestrial solutions, but also together with maybe high altitude platforms. And so all in all, 5, 5G will drive innovation in, in satcoms to start with, with a very high throughput satellite that you are aware of, but also including the Leo Meo constellations that we see uh, up emerging, driving also uh, innovation towards smaller terminals. With that, um, thank you, and your yeah, turn. Pat. Now it's, uh, the next one is Paul Verhoef, who is uh, the director for satellite navigation. So please, Paul. Good afternoon, everybody. We're going to try and uh, go on from here. Good. Um, at the moment, we are putting into place, as you know, the first constellation of uh, Galileo. You see on the right-hand side uh, the coverage with the uh, 18 satellites that uh, uh, we uh, have currently in orbit. We will be putting uh, um, another four satellites in orbit uh, in December is the current plan, and um, another four in the summer of next year. That will take us to 22 satellites, and we are two sh satellites short of the full operational constellation. Um, for that, we are buying new satellites. A contract for those eight new satellites will be signed this week, uh, right here on Thursday. What are we doing it for? Uh, obviously, we have now a phase of uh, development underway. Um, and we are, as we are completing the first constellation and having the necessary reserve satellites for that, we have started to think about um, the future and uh, where we go from here. So what is the future about? The future is about the lessons learned so far of, the, of a period of about 15 years of technology development uh, and experience in orbit, um, an evolution of user needs, very much equivalent to uh, what Magali just said in relation to 5G, where uh, navigation will play a major role as well. And of course, constantly the use of, uh, of new um, technologies. For that, we would uh, have to increase the robustness of the system. We will need further flexibility. <coughs> and of course, we need to improve services also because the other systems from our American, Russian, Chinese friends are increasing their capabilities um, as well. In analogy to what Magali said, um, we are very much um, aware that navigation will become part of the Internet of Things, of 5G, of uh, the future environment, the explosion of uh, navigation use throughout many applications is, uh, is becoming very clear. And obviously, um, in that environment, we need to uh, go to our end goal. What is it, what we want to achieve with um, with satellite navigation. We have set up a new research program for that where we really want to look into the future and to, and to what is necessary. Autonomous driving is around the corner um, and it will rely very much on satellite navigation in order to accomplish that. And um, there are many other services developments of which we have only the faintest ideas at this point in time. I pass on to um, Josef as he is available. So now hopefully we will have Josef Aschbacher from uh, California, the, he is the director of Earth Observation Programs. Philip, does it work? It's a bit distant, but it's okay. Okay, we'll wait a moment. Josef, can you hear? Okay. Yes, ah. I can hear. You hear me? Yes. Okay. So, good morning from uh, Silicon Valley, and good afternoon to all of you. Good morning. Good, yeah, good morning or good afternoon. The best is you just talk, Josef, because if we are interacting, then it will be uh, difficult. So just go ahead, talk what you would like to talk, and we are listening. 
Okay. No, no, thank you. Um, and uh, as I say, we are here in Silicon Valley. I'm here with my senior management team. Uh, the only one uh, remaining in Europe is uh, Philippe Goudy, who would also uh, step in in case uh, the uh, this connection doesn't work well. So thank you, Philippe, uh, also from here. Um, and uh, what we are doing here is we really put Space 4.0 in action. Uh, we have been uh, uh, looking for some uh, companies uh, in Silicon Valley which we want to, to visit and really explore how they work and uh, how they are uh, using uh, modern uh, technology uh, which we can then apply also in Europe in order to make sure that European companies are really at the edge of uh, what is feasible and what is doable and that they are well uh, prepared for the future. We are going to meet uh, quite a few of uh, the companies you know from uh, daily life. Uh, Google is uh, one of them, but also some uh, startups who have been uh, quite successful in putting uh, constellations uh, in orbit. Uh, one of them is Spire. Uh, but also more established ones like uh, uh, Planet, uh, whom we are going to see actually this uh, this afternoon. Uh, then we also see uh, uh, NASA Ames uh, Research Center, uh, and also, not to forget, uh, we have a visit to the Airbus uh, A3 or a cubed uh, Center, uh, which is also here in California, and which is really uh, uh, making use of the environment here in the spirit of uh, California. So what you see here uh, is Earth observation uh, as it is uh, set up today. Uh, of course, it points towards the future. Uh, we have at the moment 28 uh, satellites in development, which is the largest amount of uh, satellites we have ever had in our in our order books. Uh, we are operating 12 satellites uh, uh, at the moment, and uh, as we are launching further ones, of course, the, the number of development goes down and the number of uh, satellites in orbit goes up. Uh, there are three main streams of uh, uh, Earth observation satellites uh, we are uh, developing in ESA. The first one is uh, the science missions, which are the Earth explorers, where we are, uh, uh, express, or where we are exploring uh, uh, new science questions, uh, but really using technology which is uh, uh, which has not been flown so far and which is at the cutting edge of uh, what is uh, just uh, feasible at the moment, and where we are really developing uh, new methods and new uh, sensors and instruments. The second line is uh, Copernicus, um, uh, with, uh, the program is well established with the European Union. Uh, there are 20 Sentinels, uh, uh, which are currently uh, uh, developed in the first uh, generation. Five of them have already been uh, launched. Uh, the other 15 are coming up in the next uh, couple of uh, uh, years. Um, and the third line is uh, the meteorology missions, which are uh, done in cooperation with UMITSAT, uh, where we have a long established excellent partnership with UMITSAT to provide uh, meteorological satellites uh, in uh, geostationary and polar orbit. The next slide uh, looks towards the future, uh, which is really uh, showing what is happening now. Uh, it, it summarizes uh, uh, an uh, event which we held recently in uh, ESA in Frascati called Future EO, where we have been uh, looking at uh, what is happening in different uh, places in the world, in fact in Silicon Valley, but also in Europe, and we have invited uh, our main uh, leaders in this domain uh, to really uh, explain to us what they do, uh, to hold a mirror in front of our, of our own uh, people, our own uh, community, and uh, stimulate uh, new developments and new new elements. You see some of these names on the list here. Uh, some of them are the same ones we are going to visit uh, this week uh, here with my management team, and some of them are uh, actually uh, also uh, partners in Europe with whom we are working very well. Uh, and this really is uh, what drives us at the moment. It uh, is something that uh, we really have to consider very seriously, and it is, uh, as mentioned before, implementing uh, Space 4.0 uh, uh, as, we, as we do. The next slide uh, is actually um, showing towards the future uh, for Copernicus. Um, so what will happen in the uh, near future? You see here three main large arrows. Uh, the top left one is on current missions. Uh, the one below is the expansion. Expansion meaning that we are thinking of uh, new sentinels that are complementing the existing ones. We have today six families of sentinels uh, uh, developed, uh, being developed. Uh, we are discussing further sentinels, uh, Sentinel-7, Sentinel-8, Sentinel-9, Sentinel-10. Sentinel-7 being a, a mission on carbon dioxide, for example. Sentinel-8 uh, for agriculture uh, with a thermal infrared sensor. 
Sentinel-9 uh, for polar regions. There are two different options that are being debated. And Sentinel-10 again for mining, for agriculture uh, with a hyperspectral sensor. But these are all elements that are being debated and are consolidated with the European Commission, who, as you know, is overall uh, leading uh, Copernicus. And this um, um, then leads uh, both the expansion and the current missions into the future, uh, the next generation, and this really is something that will drive us a lot, uh, where we will reflect of uh, what will really be needed for Europe to stay on top of it in order to have the uh, current uh, sentinels as they are being developed, not only being the best ones today, because today there is nothing comparable to the sentinel families, but making sure that this also happens in the future and that the next generation of sentinels will again uh, be driving uh, technology and be the best on the market. So I think this is uh, what I could say from here. Uh, I thank you for your short attention and I hand back to, to Paris. Thank you very much, uh, Josef. With that, we go directly uh, to the next point. This is uh, Daniel Neunschwander. He is the Director of Space Transportation. Daniel. Good afternoon to everybody, and uh, welcome to this short part on launchers. You see here that we have today launchers, reliable launchers for sovereignty and growth. Sovereignty, you saw the example from Paul when launching Galileo for growth. We have today 50% of the accessible uh, worldwide market. What is important in terms of reliability to recall that on the left side, on Ariane 5, we have uh, had up to now 79 successes in a row. It brings us to a reliability of 0.99, which is even higher than what we achieved with Ariane 4. And we are steadily improving the performance. On the last slide, uh, on the last launch early of June, we had a performance for the payload of 10.85 tons. On the right side, you have Vega, nine successes in a row, and a highly accurate injection of the payload into the orbit. So where is the wind of change? The wind of change is the fact that we are going more, more and more down a road toward commercial actors in launch services worldwide. So in 2023, we will have transportation services in full operation capacity. We will be in stabilized exploitation with Ariane 6. On the left side, you have Ariane 64. In the middle, you have uh, Vega C. And on the top right, you have, uh, you have the Space Rider. What does it mean? It does mean that we go more towards a customer-oriented approach. We will insist on standardization, standardization at all levels of the interfaces for the payloads, for the main passengers, but also for uh, auxiliary passengers, but also in the way we will uh, go through co contractual schemes regarding contractual clauses, prices, etc. We have to standardize a lot. Another element which is not on this slide is transport beyond LEO. There, uh, the point is that we valorize in a disruptive way the capacities on propulsion we have here in Europe. And this brings me to the next slide, space transportation in 2032. And in function of the bullets here, the role of the public sector is increasing, meaning for access to space, the main role of the public sector will be to be first of all a customer of launch services, but also to provide enabling technologies, providing enabling technologies without distorting the market uh, afterwards. And it means it is very important in terms of IP management. Then return from space, there we will have a real change in partnerships. Uh, we will have commercial actors taking over a large part of it. We will have a space rider in operation since uh, nearly a decade, and this will be done by commercial actors. We are pretty convinced of that. And then transport in space towards new destinations, towards new partnerships. Uh, this will be an international endeavor uh, with uh, maybe varying leadership, but what we want to make sure is that we bring, whenever it comes to an international exploration endeavor, Europe on the critical path for uh, transport in space. For this, we will work and enhance the different uh, propulsion systems. You have on the bottom line a picture of, of Prometheus on the left, Berta on the right. Uh, at the end of the story, the point is less complexity in vehicles, less complexity in propulsion and efficiency and Europe on the critical path. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Daniel. 
With that, uh, we go to the next step. And this is Franco Ongaro, Director of Technology, Engineering, and Quality. Good afternoon, everybody. And uh, what is the technology shift of paradigm uh, from Space 4.0? Well, I would say, first of all, technology in ESA underpinned forever all of the missions of ESA. Everything you see is underpinned by our technology development. But Space 4.0 brings in a different relationship with industry and more responsibility for the competitiveness of industry. So when we look at our technology strategy drivers, the new ones are cost and schedule, which were not such a big concern in the past. Innovation was always there. And of course, a new one is also sustainability. So how do we address those? Well, we address them, first of all, by introducing cross-cutting activity, which go across the different disciplines, and we're no longer just bottom-up improving one technology at a time, but we're looking across in trying to find innovation at the border, but also to address problems like sustainability, therefore the clean space uh, initiative, uh, manufacturing new materials, new processes, so advanced manufacturing, and finally, I would say industry 4.0 coming to space, so designed to produce digitalization at all stages of the process, and in particular, how to bring forward the uh, assembly integration verification process, which is today one of the biggest impact on cost and schedule of our missions. Of course, we haven't forgotten uh, technology trends and innovation, so extremely precise pointing, cold atom technologies, photonics, quantum, as mentioned by the Director General, advanced sensors, and of course, cut processors in fusion in our mission, and big data. Big data, which is not only the big data that uh, Joseph sends us from space, but it's also all of the data we can process on our own mission to improve the way we design it, we build it. Uh, this is a view of what we do in clean space in a nutshell. So eco-design, uh, sustainability on Earth, clean set, uh, making sure that our future satellites can re-enter but stay competitive on the market. And ED orbit, if they cannot re-enter by themselves because they were designed in the past not with a concern in mind, then at one point we'll have to go get them. And uh, that's the way we're looking at the technologies necessary to be able to do that in full safety. Uh, design to produce, the cycle of design, manufacturing assembly, integration testing, and the methodologies from design to production that we're trying to infuse. Of course, they're already being put forward for large series, but the bulk of what we do is not large series, and therefore, we need to bring this in in all the way we do things. Finally, we've been always trying to prove uh, our technologies in orbit to convince our colleagues to adopt them. Uh, CubeSats have become a very good way to do that, a very cheap one that allows us to really push the technology because they're cheap to launch, cheap to operate and build. And in fact, if you just go around the corner later, you will see the example of COMEX4, uh, which has flown some uh, extremely interesting technologies and bridges the Space 4.0 because it did work with a very popular iPhone or telephone app, mobile app like uh, uh, Flight Radar 24. And it communicates the position of planes over the oceans, while Flight Radar 24 usually can only rely on ADSB on the continent. And having said that, I think I'll pass over to my colleague and I kept to my time. So Dave. the next one is uh, David Parker. He is the Director for Human and Robotic Exploration. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here to tell you a little bit about what's happening and what's changing the world of ESA and space exploration. The era of Space 4.0 is about change, and in fact, ESA's exploration program has made a radical change in the past months. So we have unified the different elements of robotic, human exploration, the different destinations that we're working on, into a single program, boringly called the European Exploration Envelope Program, E3P for short. And uh, I'll give you a little introduction, a little flavor of it this afternoon, but we have a dedicated uh, press briefing tomorrow afternoon back here at 2.45 with a lot more detail. 
But the first question is, why do we explore at all? Well, we have an exploration strategy agreed by ministers several years ago now, focused on three destinations where humans one day will live and work, or in case of low Earth orbit, are already living and working. Some of you may have seen Thomas Pesquet uh, already today, and he's an example of somebody who's been living and working for six months in low Earth orbit. Why do we go? Why do we explore? Uh, four reasons summarized here. It's about, of course, science for understanding new knowledge, about fundamental knowledge about how a universe works, but also information we can bring down, back down here to Earth to help us. Some of that is related to the technology we're developing, but new knowledge, you could call it science, if you like. Then we have challenge-driven innovation, the, the push of trying to do almost impossible things, explore the planets, set out uh, to, with humans and robots to go to the difficult to get to places. That demands technology that we bring back and can use on Earth. I always use the example, as you and I use more than 100 litres of water a day, an astronaut is already using only three or four litres of water. But if we're going to go and live and work on the moon and one day on Mars, we have to get even better in recycling. So all those kind of recycling technologies are entirely relevant to bring back to planet Earth. And everything we do in exploration is in cooperation. Global cooperation with our partners such as NASA and Roscosmos, but also increasingly with commercial partners. And I'll give you an example in a moment about an innovative commercial partnership. And I've already mentioned the astronauts. It's all about inspiration, of course, inspiring the next generation. And in a sense, Space 4.0 has these four themes of inspire, uh, and they're captured here in the sense that we are in informing new knowledge, we're innovating, we're interacting globally and with commerce, and we're inspiring the next generation. So what are we actually doing? We have a program, this is the menu just for the next few years, but the right-hand side I'm only going to hint at today, or we'll talk more about tomorrow, is where we may be going into the long term. But we will continue to operate the space station, Thomas come back, but uh, Italian-born European astronaut uh, Paolo Nespoli will be going up there later, the end of July. Next year, Alex Gerst will command the space station. And uh, the astronauts will be undertaking a world-class science. Some of that is uh, science that we bring back to planet Earth, but some of that is preparing us to go further. The tools and techniques we need to protect our astronauts, support our astronauts as they go further out in space. And one of the exciting things that's happening is we have a strong partnership with NASA building the service modules, the power and propulsion that will push the Orion craft back towards the moon, starting with an unmanned mission in 2019, the first launch of the space launch system, this incredible rocket, as, as biggest thing we've seen since the days of Saturn V, and in the second mission, taking astronauts to loop round the moon uh, for the first deep space exploration since the days of Apollo. We're continuing our Mars Express program. We had tremendous support at the last ministerial to complete the program. The ExoMars orbiter is currently in the error breaking phase where it's gradually getting down to its circular orbit to do its science to sniff out the trace gases in the, in the atmosphere of Mars. But something new we're working on and agreed by our ministers is a further collaboration with our Russian colleagues where we're going to go to the surface of the moon for the first time to take, use a, a European preci precision landing system to the surface of the moon, to use a drill to d go below the surface and s try and taste the water that we now believe is there. You know, I always like to say we used to think that the moon was a boring place, but I always say the moon is a, is a museum of four and a half billion years of solar system history. And so far, all we've done is go to the gift shop for a few days and come back again. <laughs> we have to go back. There's a lot more the moon can tell us about its own history and about the history of the solar system. And we'll start to do that with our lunar mission. And beyond that, we're looking towards working with NASA uh, and beyond low Earth orbit exploration, perhaps with the Deep Space Gateway, and missions that will take us not just to the planet, but back again. The sample return, the round trip mission planetary destinations. All those are exciting things we'll talk about a bit more tomorrow. But as an example of what we're doing in Space 4.0 that is more modest, but shows you how quickly ESA is changing and how we can do things that are very relevant in this dynamic Silicon Valley world of new space, if you like. Here's something we're going to sign the deal on tomorrow with a, a Belgium company 
that next year we'll put aboard the space station a module that will allow scientists, engineers, universities, maybe schools, to put payloads aboard the space station starting next year. A kind of CubeSats aboard the space station, 10 centimeter cubes or multiples of if you like, and for a fixed price. There's a price list and there's even an educational discount. And we will use an existing control center, commercial investment and a partnership with ESA to deliver this service starting next year. And that gives you a flavor of what we're now doing in exploration. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Dave. Uh, we go on. We remain in this exploration and science field, but now focusing on the science point. And it's Alvaro Jimenez, uh, who, will, who is the director of science programs in ESA, who will uh, t tell you what we are planning in that field. Please, Alvaro. Good afternoon. And of course, science is driven by curiosity. And we want to understand the universe uh, we live in, an amazing universe. Some time ago, we knew, we found out, human beings, us, we are not at the center of the universe. Now, we know, so that's the change of paradigm, is that we are not even made of what the universe is made of. Most of the universe is made of matter which is totally different than what we know, like um, us, planets, stars, galaxies. 25% of the universe is made of dark matter. Nice to call it matter, but we don't know what it is, really. We are trying to understand that with missions like Gaia, for example, and others. And we also have found that 70% of the universe is dark energy, which is even more elusive because it has no effect in uh, gravity, of course. And we don't know what it is, and we are developing missions to understand it, like Euclid. And we are well aware that this, as expressed in uh, Space 4.0, lead us to cooperation. We had to cooperate to go beyond an example of which is JWST to be launched uh, next year together with uh, NASA to actually explore the universe with the best tools we could ever have. And of course there is another change of paradigm which is trying to understand the universe not with the light we get from these all objects around which is the normal matter we see but try to look in a different way, try to look to the ripples in space-time that were predicted by Einstein 100 year ago, years ago, and we know now that we can measure. We can measure gravitational waves and understand, listen to the dark universe, listen to actually what we cannot see. And we are also not only curiosity driven, in addition, we want to challenge industry to get them doing more difficult things, getting closer to the sun, closer and closer with missions like Solar Orbiter, or going to uh, weird planets like uh, Mercury with uh, Bepi Colombo, a, a planet that is the closest uh, to the sun and is the last of the terrestrial planet we want to analyze in detail to understand the formation of our own solar system. And of course, the other thing that uh, we human beings are interested in is, is in inspired by the need to understand if there is life beyond Earth. And that implies looking for water in different ways. Water, in particular, in uh, liquid oceans that may be below the crust, ice crust, of the moons of Jupiter, of some of the moons of Jupiter, and we are developing now a mission called JUICE to go there and look for these moons and look if there is water there that could be leading to some kind of uh, life in, uh, in this world. Of course, also driving us to the, the, the final goal of finding life somewhere else by looking into kind of all kind of possible planets around extrasolar planets, around other stars rather than the sun in our galaxy, and looking if there are traces of possibilities of that life may have emerged in these uh, worlds. For that, we also have missions like uh, one which is uh, called Plato, and we will look for exactly a, a twin of us, a kind of planet like Earth, but around another star like the sun. And I pass yeah. over. Yes, thank you very much, yes. Alvaro. We are now coming back to Earth a bit, uh, to the director of operations, Rolf Densing, 
who takes care from the base, from the ground of all of these uh, different activities. Rolf, please. Thank you very much and good afternoon, everybody. Let's consider we are here in the year 2030 and we look back to the good old days when former ESA Director General Jan Werner was former? pushing, former. Was pushing uh, Space 4.0. Of course, then, uh, this, gave new, uh, this gave an impetus to uh, standardization, harmonization, uh, spacecraft uh, became more and more uh, automated and or, or autonomous, and uh, communication between space and ground uh, became a lot more efficient, also due to uh, the European uh, data, uh, the, uh, the optical communication system, the European uh, data, relay uh, data relay system, which was back then uh, run in uh, Magali's telecom pro uh, program. Uh, so, uh, a earthly control center would probably uh, be staffed with only very few people, and uh, robots would be handling. Uh, uh, huge fleets of uh, spacecraft, so the human would just be a supervisor, uh, robots would be running the uh, program, he is the robot, and uh, they would be talking, uh, of course, and not uh, this old-fashioned keyboards, mouse uh, uh, communication. Uh, so this would take care of uh, space operations. In the year 2030, uh, a program on space traffic management and uh, protecting Earth and assets in space will be among the highlights of the European uh, Space Agency. A lot of this will be uh, in private hands. Uh, private uh, space weather uh, services uh, will make good business uh, because uh, military uh, electrical power companies, airports, uh, Oil drilling companies uh, will pay a huge amount of money to get a space weather forecast uh, because this is what they need and this is what will save them a lot of money. Of course, uh, when looking at the space environment and protecting Earth from uh, dangers out of space, we need to look at space debris. Uh, so the forecasts uh, we did in the year 2017 uh, are about real. Uh, by now we will have uh, uh, about uh, 1.2 million pieces in the year 2030 of space debris, bigger than one centimeter. Back then in 2017, it were uh, only about half as much. And uh, due to the uh, uh, vision of ESA and the leadership of the European Union, uh, the different players overcame their vanities. Uh, they all put their resources together into one joint worldwide catalog on space debris in order to avoid uh, a further increase of space debris. Uh, uh, in ESA, we had a publicly uh, funded program already done a couple years back uh, to bring back uh, big satellites uh, as they are the most dangerous uh, pieces of space debris and the potentially biggest contributors uh, uh, in the adverse sense uh, to our space uh, and environment. Uh, when looking at our space environment, we also need to consider near-Earth objects that are flying towards Earth. Here an uh, imagination that uh, old-fashioned people had in the year 1966. Coincidentally, a favorite uh, German TV series uh, that our director general used to like. And uh, so, uh, but more seriously, we uh, looked uh, even before 2017 at, a, uh, at an asteroid, uh, 2005 EL70, uh, uh, which is potentially coming closer to our Earth with our fly-eye telescopes, uh, which got deployed in the year 2018. Uh, we characterized it even closer. Uh, under the leadership of uh, UN uh, organizations, uh, we started a uh, asteroid deflection mission, and uh, this is uh, something we could easily do because under Space 4.0, uh, industry got a lot more empowered uh, than, uh, than than it was back in the old days. Uh, the public sector would only provide uh, high-level requirements and only do. Uh, a very few 
uh, high-level reviews and, uh, and this way uh, development schedules and price uh, became a lot more stable. And uh, so we avoided an impact of this uh, dangerous asteroid uh, which would have uh, created a crater of uh, 1.5 kilometers on Earth. So uh, this is how we saved the Earth in the year 2030. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rolf. And now, last but not least, uh, it's Eric Morel, uh, who is uh, responsible for all the procurements and uh, legal services and interactions with industry. Please, Eric. So, good afternoon. You have heard uh, all the projects uh, of my colleagues in order to put those projects uh, into reality, you need uh, a strong and competitive European space industry. And this industry will have to be reinforced in order to be there to serve the ambitions of uh, Europe in space. For the time being, most of these uh, programs are organized on the basis of a traditional client-provider type of uh, relations. This is how most of the satellites you see around you or above your heads have been developed. But things are changing and the wind of change is also uh, in the procurement world. Uh, we have uh, now, uh, starting with the programs of uh, Magali Vessier in Telecom, we have introduced in ESA the approach of public-private partnerships. Uh, this approach is now being enlarged uh, beyond Telecom to Earth observation, tomorrow to navigation. Uh, also, a very important uh, change, uh, recent change in the field of uh, launchers, uh, Ariane 6, for the first time, has been uh, uh, developed on the basis of a new sharing of risks and responsibilities between the public and the private sector. Things like uh, business incubator, technology transfer, uh, grand challenge are r realities of uh, today and even more realities uh, of tomorrow. What we see today is that uh, we are in front of uh, two main convergence in the space sector. The first one is the convergence between uh, the space uh, uh, sector and the digital economy. And this is uh, a um, very important element that is uh, changing the way the space industry is, uh, is operating. You see it uh, today as a reality, the way to produce uh, uh, satellites. Uh, we speak now about uh, satellites uh, where we will produce for some of the constellation up to four satellites per day. We are entering a new world, a new world that is possible only through this uh, digitalization. The second convergence is the conversion between space and non-space. And uh, this is uh, opening the door for uh, sectors that are seen not only through the space angle, but are seen as uh, a market of its own, being its safety, uh, health, energy, mobility, education, resources. Uh, those are sectors uh, where a space can bring part of it uh, in conjunction with, uh, with a number of uh, Earth's uh, capacities. I would just take uh, one example in this domain, being uh, the Arctic, for example. Uh, in the field of the Arctic, you need uh, to serve the well-being of those living over there. You have also to ensure a sustainable development of the resources that you can find in the Arctic. And at the same time, you must find ways to cross the Arctic with your boat. And, uh, and this, when you look at those needs, uh, you see an obvious manner that what you need is telecom, you need navigation, you need meteorological data, you need Earth observation data, and you need to put all that in a system, a system of systems. And this is my last word. This is, I think, space 4.0. Thank you. Thank you. Go ahead with the next slide, Trust. Okay, so thank you very much for all the presentations. Now, uh, I, of course, press has the possibility to ask questions. If you have a question, please raise your arm. You will get immediately a microphone from me, and then uh, introduce yourself, and uh, please uh, then raise the question. So who has a question, who would like to ask something, please. Okay. Okay, well, this, is the, this is the microphone. <laughs> yeah, it is a microphone. <laughs> Okay, my, my question is about transportation. I, I think I heard there's going to be a lot more commercial involvement, I think was mentioned, and also 
I was also surprised to hear you expect Space Rider to be operated privately. I wonder if you could expand on those two aspects. Yes, thank you. I mean, it, it's very clear. Uh, the offer, offer in the next decade is increasing. Uh, the demand uh, will have a certain cycle. We'll uh, see how it oh. evolves. <laughs> oh, keep it's teach okay. your life, please, <laughs> Philip. <laughs> And Every in this time. context, uh, we have to come up with modular services and here also the fact to have a space lab, a platform, Space Rider is de facto a, a space lab a platform in low Earth orbit, will open a new ways. What I meant when I spoke about the Horizon 2032 is that it will not be the public sector anymore which will operate it. I mean, the, we will have developed it but we will have handed over the exploitation totally to the commercial actors. There will be no institutional guaranteed market for space lab services. Further questions, please? And in introduce yourself again. And then okay, uh, Simon Rosé from uh, Radio France Internationale. I have a question about uh, um, asteroid threats. Is there a successor to the AIM mission? as we have seen on the slide. Are you working on the new AIM? OK, so uh, uh, there was, of course, we had this uh, proposal at the 2016 Ministerial Council in Lucerne. And uh, we were close to realize it uh, when uh, some of the member states were not able to provide the money we needed. So we, will, uh, we are working on it still. We are providing, uh, at, at least at the next ministerial, uh, another program for that, so uh, therefore this is still an uh, issue we believe is very important. Maybe Rolf, you would like to say an additional sentence, or Franco, I don't know, so one of you, both. Uh, well, what I can say is that uh, clearly AIM was only half of a mission that we are uh, working on with uh, NASA, IDA, and the NASA part that goes ahead. So we're looking at, uh, of course, as DG said, bringing something to the next ministerial, but at the same time, uh, trying to look at what we can do with the Americans to keep up the cooperation and help them into realizing what was the original idea of the IDA. Maybe I can say a few words in addition. I, I, sometimes it's said it's too academic, but I try it anyhow. So if you are doing different things, you have different probability of something happens. So if we are doing a test, a test just of, a, of some spacecraft, then uh, there might be a high probability that it fails, but it's a very low value because it's a test case. If we are discussing about an operational system, like for instance uh, communication or Galileo or whatever, then the damage in case we have a failure is much more expensive. So we have to lower the probability. If we now look to the uh, impact of a meteorite, the probability may be very, very low, but the damage is too big. So we have to take care of it, or so the probability is low. And uh, one issue is, of course, we cannot guarantee the politicians that this will happen in the next term of them. So therefore, it's a long-term perspective, and therefore it's a little bit more difficult to get the money for that. But we will try, because we feel that this is a responsibility of us. So next question. Who is it? Okay, I try. Yeah. Thierry Dubois, Aviation Week. I think Mr. Neuschwander mentioned that ESA wants launchers to be less complex in future. Could you elaborate on that? Less complexity for launchers? We're doing it already. Yes, um, we are doing it this already now uh, with, uh, with the current development, but it is clear that beyond RN6 and Vega C, uh, we have to diminish the complexity in the launch vehicle and in the, first of all, number of uh, propulsion systems. This is very clear. The number of the complexity of the technology to simplify uh, the operation that at the end it's a matter about costs. So this is what we are working on it. We got at the last ministerial over 200 million on the future launcher preparatory program. In uh, addition to the running A6 and uh, in Vega. addition to the current development programs, which yeah. allows us, of course, to prepare the phases uh, coming after RN6 and uh, Vega C. And to be very clear, I think Europe has to accelerate its work on these dedicated items. So, please. 
uh, Alexander Stern, freelance science writer. Uh, if I remember correctly, two years ago we had uh, IX3 in front of this hall at uh, Le Boucher. What, what happened to the program? Will it be all be incorporated into Space Rider? Will it survive somewhere else? Okay, what, what will, will be the future? I will hand over in a second again to uh, Daniel, but it was clear we had a discussion about that because IXV was very successful. We had uh, uh, re-entry uh, and we recovered the, the spaceship, everything was fine. And then was the question, the next step, should it be a bigger one, should it be the same one? And then we came up with the idea of the Space Rider, which is something taking the heritage of IXV, not creating a totally new spacecraft, but using as much as possible. But you can t say it much better, Daniel, please. No, DG brought, brought it to the point. Uh, IXV was a technology demonstration. It worked uh, perfectly well. We can capitalize on, the, on a lot of data out of IXV. Based on this data, uh, we prepared the Space Rider program. Uh, Space Rider is taking, in addition to IXV, also uh, the uh, heritage out of the Vega development program, Vega slash Vega C, uh, with the AVOM, the upper stage. And uh, we go now for a fully operational capacity with Space Rider. And you see there also a link between what space transportation is doing and what is done in exploration. You heard about this microgravity experiment on board the station. We need in the future always the possibility to do microgravity experiments very quickly. And therefore, David uh, started this uh, program with the ice cubes. Uh, you can see them, I think, over there. Um, and now this is uh, the other possibility for the future to have also this uh, with a, a European spacecraft. Further questions? Do you see in the front row? <laughs> Don't hesitate. Um, the, for David Parker, the second Orion exploratory mission, the Lunar Loop, is in 2021, if I'm not mistaken. Can we hope to have a European astronaut on board? Uh, great question. Uh, the answer is, so the second service module is, in fact, a barter with NASA for our continued work aboard the space station. So, uh, no, that, there will not be uh, ESA astronauts on that Orion, but you can imagine that it is very much our ambition to uh, secure opportunities for, you, for European astronauts to go beyond low Earth orbit. And it's a little bit of what I was hinting at as to what the future program is, is aiming at uh, for that period in the next decade. Okay, further questions? If there's not directly questions from the press, also the people around can, of course, also ask questions. We always want to part have participation, as we said. And we are not only open for questions, we are also open for comments. So if the press has some opinion, yeah, you should do this or that, so please uh, be active, don't be calm. There is another one, please. <laughs> uh, on, the, on the issue of procurement, um, I, I seem to be hearing a lot about moving things to the private sector and away from the institutions. Is this is, this, is there an overall shift and eventually, eventually um, you, you want most things, you want, you want to go to the private sector to, to buy what, what you need for your institutional yeah. needs? Is that, is that the long-term hope? I think, but Eric will answer that as, as well. I, I tried with my explanation, we have a shift of paradigm. Yes, we have commercialization, that, but that does not mean that all the space activities will be Privatized. That's my opinion. My opinion is there are areas like, for instance, telecommunication, where we already also we do not have the projects of producing a totally new uh, telecommunication satellite just with uh, public funding. But uh, at least 50% comes usually from industry. We have an Earth observation. We have the Incube system where we are doing now public-private partnership. We have in um, the space transportation. We have. Uh, uh, now also private money, for instance, for the development of Ariane 64, 62. We have in, um, in, uh, in the question of exploration, we have private money, we have in technology development. So we have it in all the different fields, but my personal opinion is still the, the roles of um, the importance of space agency will remain because we are the enablers, the facilitators, and also taking the responsibility for the society as such. Uh, but Eric, maybe you can add something from your point of view, how you see the development. 
But uh, two, two elements that I uh, would like to say. First is the diversity. Uh, you have uh, heard a minute ago the diversity of the programs that are presented to you. And there is no one size fits it all. So those programs are so different that we have different approaches. And that is, I think, the, the secret. And one of the strong points of ESA is this capacity to adapt to the needs. And that is one element. But the second one is that uh, even in the more traditional approach, we need to evolve. And we need to evolve to be sure that uh, our programs are implemented on time and implemented on cost. And this is a permanent fight that is uh, pushing us to transform our procurement process to better cope with the reality of industry of today, which is quite a different than the one of a few years ago. Uh, industry today is more mature, they are more able to cope with large projects than it was in the past, and therefore the share of responsibilities and risk is evolving. And in addition, we have a lot of small and medium-sized enterprises or new companies entering through our incubation, business incubation centers directly into some uh, areas in earth observation. It's a very broad field. So it's, it's not black and white. It's not black and white. This is uh, the message. So it's something that will grow organically. There's no conscious policy being implemented. We are not looking forward to make us, uh, ourselves uh, not any longer necessary. So we are really, un uh, so it's really that we believe that the space agency, especially an agency like we are, where we are putting together different member states, 22 member states, plus Slovenia, plus Canada. So this diversity of member states gives us, of course, also some challenge, but I believe our responsibility for, for this single, simple and small blue dot is something we have to tackle and we have to take care of. And therefore, I believe the, the roles will change, but the, 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 the necessity of space agencies will remain. Dans la mesure où nous sommes au Salon du Bourget, certains peuvent poser des questions en français, si vous le souhaitez. Si nécessaire. Si c'est nécessaire. <rire> You can ask also in German, then I say this one. <laughs> no, no, please in English. Or French. French is also okay. No, French is not an option, I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, we already heard about the future launcher program. Mm, a lot of talk in, in the industry and in the public today is about reusability of spacecrafts and of launchers. Uh, what's uh, ESA's position on this? Uh, is it a hype? Is it a solid business model? And what are the, the next steps? So I, I start with a polemic answer, <laughs> and then Daniel will give the right one. You see, we have in launchers, we do not have a mass market. This is something we have to understand, at least not for Europe. If you have a mass market, you will, of course, look to something like reusability in a different way than if you have no mass market. Now, look to a mass market. I take always the same example. Look to this. This is for sure a mass market, bottles. If you go into a shop, you get all different types of bottles. You get bottles which are reusable. You are getting bottles which can be recycled. You even get bottles where you, which you cannot recycle. So, so you get all different types. So if a mass market has not finally decided, how can we do it for a non-mass market? This is now the polemic answer. Now the real answer comes from Daniel, as always. I'm just the director general, so Daniel. <laughs> Maybe I should answer in French, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, to, to start, I mean, Ariane 6 and Vega C, uh, this is the best answer Europe can give towards the current challenges. Let's uh, face this, and these two uh, uh, launch systems are not basically conceived for reusability. This is very clear. This does not mean that we are not working on it. It's the other way around. We are working on it in this uh, program I mentioned, FLPP, just before. And uh, as the director general said, uh, with a lot of uh, uh, images, you have to look into the market at the end what it means. And I think this, uh, on this we don't have the detailed answers today. This is very clear. But what I can tell you today is that the most important costs are in the first stage and uh, that we will certainly focus the work on the reusability on, at this first. 
Yes, and in addition, one has to say that with IAN 64, 62, and Vega C, we are already looking to a dramatic cost decrease. So this is clear. I mean, it's not that we are just making another launcher. So we are really heading for cheaper prices, cheaper costs, uh, which give, gives us hopefully a good uh, situation in a very heavy competitive market, east and west. Ah, this is launcher market is heavy. So please. Just, just a quick follow-up. Uh, are we on, on the way to a mass market, looking at, at these big constellations that are being launched and so on? Uh, so um, that depends very much what you believe what the mega constellations will do. I mean, we are talking with the mega constellations about thousands of satellites, maybe. We are talking about also with mega constellations about possible failures of satellites. Let's assume 10% are failing then uh, Rolf has another type of work in the future because of a lot of uh, satellites, um, uh, de satellite debris. Uh, so there might be something like a micro mass market. It is not thousands of launches, uh, but f uh, the world market might be some hundred in that respect. But whether it, this is, comes also to Europe, we are right now looking for a market of about, all together, Vega and uh, Ayane, 16, 17, or what is in the right number per year? Uh, we are, the answer is uh, 15. We are at, um, on models of 11 Ariane uh, 6 and 4 Vega, current, yes. Vega C currently. So, so this is still not really a, a must market, huh? but the development might be. And therefore, as Daniel was saying, we are looking into all of this. And when we are talking about reusability, we are not only talking about reusability using the engine of the first stage, but also different possibilities. Uh, okay, further questions. So we, we have one that's not a journalist. Can you introduce yourself? Yeah, please. Hello, my name is Christian Arminger. I'm from a company of the German Aerospace Center. Rolf Denzing mentioned the important topic of space traffic management. And so looking in the future, fly, having suborbital flights flying from Paris to Sydney in 90 minutes, um, there is a lot of rules and regulations to be dealt between the aviation organizations. So we have the ICAO. Will there be an international civil space organization or which role will ESA play in this uh, part of the game? The best. Thank you. That's a very interesting question. Uh, so for everybody, if you want to fly around Earth, which is what our astronauts do, like Thomas Reiter, uh, it takes about 90 minutes to fly around Earth. If you want to fly to New, New Zealand, uh, if you do it on a rocket, you can be there in about 45 minutes. And this is what you're asking about. So could we do this uh, operationally and commercially? Uh, or could we even ship uh, spare parts, parcels? Uh, or could we use it for military interventions? Uh, well, uh, I'm a bit shy to answer this. Um, but what you ask about is uh, space traffic management. Uh, so this is this uh, suborbital flights is one thing. Uh, another thing is the increasing traffic of uh, small sats, cube sats, of mega constellations of thousands of uh, swarm of thousands of satellites. And uh, we believe uh, that we uh, need to come even in a position in Europe that we can negotiate. Uh, regulation. Uh, this is probably, uh, when it comes to regulation, when it comes to security, this is probably nothing where ESA would have a political role, but where ESA could provide knowledge. Uh, knowledge we have from uh, decades of research on space debris, uh, of knowing our space and, uh, and environment. And this is uh, why we need to get closer uh, between ESA and EU um, to really get going with a space traffic management program. We can, this I believe, we can do this only jointly. Okay, further comments, questions, interests? Please, here. I'm not, I'm not sending. <laughs> <laughs> My throat's giving out. So, Jonathan Amos from uh, the BBC. There is a lot of interest in um, the small satellite sector in having a launcher that's sized 
for them, uh, not just for cost reasons, but for schedule reasons as well. Um, a lot of uh, the newer rockets, small rockets, are coming from America. Um, Electron, um, Virgin is working on a uh, launcher one uh, as well. And I'm just wondering, uh, is there anything that we can be doing in Europe to, to see that our homegrown industries also have access to a small launcher to, uh, to launch payloads in Europe? Thank you. Um, first of all, we have, since the last Ministerial Council in Lucerne, we have the Triple L program, which is a stand for Light Set Launch uh, Solutions, on which uh, we optimize the volume under the fairing, which may, uh, means that we want to give a ride opportunity to auxiliary payloads, uh, small payloads especially, on each, on each flight, uh, being it uh, Ariane 6 or uh, Vega C. Having said this, uh, also in Europe, we have some uh, initiatives, uh, privately led uh, ventures on, uh, on micro launchers. And from ESA side, uh, we, we are currently in the process of uh, going out uh, with some uh, studies to analyze the business case between, uh, behind, sorry, behind uh, micro launchers. And this will be the key step number one. Then I could imagine that uh, ESA goes one step further in technology maturation but at a certain moment in time, uh, put it to the market or make it available to the market in order not to distort it. Okay, thank you. Any further request for a comment or for a question? Then, Philip, you. I think uh, we should um, thank everyone, starting with all the directors, director general for, uh, for this um, presentations and then thank you for the audience for this interaction. We will have this Agora every day and sometime in the morning, sometime at 16. I remember tomorrow, tomorrow will be with institutional. We'll have all the heads of the main agencies and also the uh, heads of the delegations from the member states of ESA. So they will be here and we'll have a similar talk with them, different angle different uh, aspect, but all Space 4.0. And then, on industry, we have a few startups coming with uh, Eric Morel. We'll have an animation here on Wednesday, uh, also about the same time, at 1600. And Thursday, we have a citizen poll. So we have a, a sample of people coming, representing the citizen from the uh, politics to the uh, scientists the young people, and they will be here, and we will have also interaction during, uh, during the Thursday event uh, at 11 o'clock. And then Thomas is coming back on, Wednesday, on Friday morning, and this is a little gift. We will have a fantastic presentation of Thomas outside, and then we will be able to have another set of questions with him. And this is on Friday morning at 11 o'clock. Finally, Saturday and Sunday, we will still have all, some of our directors and director general here, and this will be full of kids, bloggers, and YouTubers, people who are expert in social media. So we'll have a completely new setup. So you're welcome to join us there. So I wish you an excellent week and a very fruitful dialogue with us. Thank you very much. <laughs>